this investigation by Evidence Paranormal, the team travels to Springfield, Missouri to a 100-year-old historic landmark known as the Pythian Castle. Within its dark corridors, tunnel, and dungeon, will these two somehow manage to make contact with the spirits and ghosts of the past? And if so, will they be friendly? Evidence Paranormal once again hits the highways, southbound to the town of Springfield, Missouri. This three-hour drive will take us to the 100-year-old limestone structure known as the Pythian Castle. This event was given by the Paranormal Task Force, whom also hosted the Tri-County Truck Stop last month. I was pretty excited to visit this place. And of all the places we've investigated, this is by far the largest to date. After the long, uncomfortable three-hour drive, I was glad to get off the highway and drive through the town of Springfield and search for the U.S. military base, which I knew neighbored our destination. And once I found it, I was in awe of what we were driving up to. This structure was so huge, I almost felt like I had to rethink my approach to how I wanted to investigate it. We've never done something this size, but we were for sure not turning back now. The Pythian Castle is without a doubt a paranormal investigator's dream come true. This 40,000 square foot limestone behemoth was built and completed in 1913 by the fraternal order known as the Knights of Pythias. Originally built as an orphanage and senior citizen home for its members and their families. In 1942, the U.S. military acquired the property by what was known as Order of Immediate Possession. The building became part of the O'Reilly General Hospital and was used for injured recovering veterans of World War II. On Friday nights, bands would even play while husband hungry ladies attended. A little known fact is that high ranking German prisoners of war were transferred here and interrogated. Years later in 2003, Tamara Finacciero and her mother bought the castle and opened it to the public in 2010. Presently, they offer historical tours, host weddings, mystery theater dinners, private parties, and of course, paranormal events. Which is exactly what we, like many others, were there for. The event began with Greg Myers, president of the Paranormal Task Force, sharing with us some of their own personal experiences from many of their previous investigations performed here. He then introduced Cindy Shipley, our tour guide for the evening, who presented a film for us to watch, which explained the history of this amazing building. When visiting, the castle's beauty, as well as the size, can be very overwhelming. 
During the military's ownership and control of the castle, there were at least a dozen German prisoners of war, as well as maybe 60 Italian soldiers that were kept in the castle's dungeon. One bit of information we were told is that there's a bowling alley located in the basement. Here, in the theater room, EVPs that were captured by other paranormal investigators were played for us. A definite inspiration for our own investigation forthcoming. In the Pythian Castle, stories can range from tales of a childlike spirit they've called Petey to that of a spirit in the tower area that the paranormal task force can personally attest are not so friendly. While admiring art and furniture of an upstairs bedroom, we were able to capture still photos of light anomalies floating across the air. As Greg Myers snapped photos in our direction, I was telling Mary of eye aches that I was experiencing. In response to my claim, she too began taking pictures around me, and in one, she captured this unusual anomaly in the mirror with me. As you can see, my camcorder lights were off. The flash from Mary's camera reveals that the residual cleaning streaks on the mirror's surface go from the 8 o'clock to the 2 o'clock direction, but the lightning streaks go from the 4 to 10 o'clock position. Very unusual. Later on, as our historical and paranormal tour came to a close, many attendees gathered to share photos they had taken. Of course, there were many things worth photographing in the dungeon. There was even Japanese artwork left behind on a prison wall. But now it was time to focus and make use of what we learned from our tour and try to reach out and connect with anyone who might not have made that transition. And as the sun goes down outside, the awareness levels inside begin to rise. And so it seems reality is about to make its entrance. Within minutes of the historical tour ending, the paranormal tour began. We were to follow the members of the paranormal task force below into the dungeon area once again to the dark and cramped tunnel which is now partially blocked off. As stories go, if a person is to go to the far end of the tunnel, in complete darkness, they can sometimes hear the sound of footsteps walking towards them, with the feelings of panic and fear. With our camcorders prepared, we wanted to see if this would of course happen for us. Feel that you're not alone here. And 
and something is at that other end of the tunnel moving toward you. And if you ask, is there anyone there, you won't get any answers, but you'll still hear the footsteps. Suddenly, from the other end of the tunnel, PTF member Mike Brown appears with a flashlight to verify our presence in the tunnel. You guys down here, Yes. Upon learning that we're still in the tunnel, he turns away, but the light continues. Are you down here tonight? Do you remember us from last time? Can you knock on this pipe for us? Trying to escape from here. The hop and see. Knock on the pipe for us. You've never told us your name. Can you give us your name? The Hob and Z. prefer to come out late at night, but can you do an early show for us? Can you tell me what year it is? Do you know who the current president is? Did you die at this location? Let's go ask and see if anyone had a flashlight. But that was funny because it would start out. Okay, we can all start heading back the other way. There was a flashlight, though. 
You would it would have like completely lit up this. Oh, what it if it was aimed up, if it was aimed down this way, though, it, it should have. Two minutes, three minutes of us getting down there. Yeah. Okay. Because when you guys walked down there, I had my light kind of around there, but I didn't go all the way down the end with you. So by the time you got down to the end, my light was off, and I was not. There. Also, by the time we got down to the end, did you see the light by the time we were at the end? Well, no. I was already, I was already at the end, and I had this on and facing that way. So. Okay. So then you may have, I'll review the video footage, and that'll tell us. Yeah. Okay. The funny thing is, you didn't. No, it was constant. So if that was not PTF member Mike Brown at the end of the tunnel, who was it pretending to be him? Below in the basement is a chamber tucked away with many tales to tell. The interrogation room. Here, official high-ranking Nazi prisoners of war were brought in and put under intense questioning for their time-sensitive information. We're not talking simple soldiers. We mean head officers and decision makers. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't feeling a bit on edge going in here. You can just imagine the methods the U.S. military used and how far they would go to get the information they needed to win the battles before them. This is where they were interrogated and there are signs. stories that we've heard, the high-ranking German officers, not the average soldiers, were brought to this area for information. And the information was perishable, so they used very aggressive techniques on them to get information from these higher-ranking German officers. You know, it would be interesting to be able to do one of those one of those lights to tell whether there's blood ever been. Are you a 
German soldier. Can you start reading some of your questions in German? Yeah, I can start with uh, how about uh, we have in Z? make a sound for us. That was all was right. Yeah. That's just a footnote to my camera so that I know that that was a person. So if you say it again, I'll try my best to say it in German. There he is, that again. Can you make a loud sound for us? Machen Sie ein Lons Gerisch für uns. trapped in this room. What's your rank? That's right. Was war ihr dein Stuttgart? Chair over. 
Indeed, if the spirits of the tortured enemy officers were here, it was clear they had no interest in obliging us with interaction. Yeah, let's move on to the next prison cell. I'm curious if later we'll be able to scream. Watch your step here. Soon we would divide into individual teams and investigate. The fun was just about to begin. And so we began our investigation by working our way into the POW hallway, where all the prisoners of war were kept. It was my hope to start here and attract someone interested in communicating with us. On these decorated walls were some of the artwork done by the prisoners themselves. Eventually, we moved along to other rooms in search of the past residents who just might never have left. This could probably read what you're saying. Translate.
to speak with me, maybe? That was you knocking. Can you do it again? After about an hour and a half investigating in the basement cells, chatter could be heard coming from the hallway, merely guests and investigators passing by. But regardless of how much fun we were having, it was time now to move along in search of more active locations within the castle. The experiences we've had thus far in the dungeon hallway were beginning to thin out. So we were moving right along to other areas in search of the next stage of activity. And the best place to look, we felt, was in the most perfect place. The darkest, unoccupied corners before us. We rounded a corner near the tunnel we investigated earlier that evening. For some reason, I felt drawn to a doorway straight ahead of me. It sounded like I had caught somebody off guard, like a solid heavy person had scooted their foot across the top step. I made a 360 degree turn to evaluate whether or not the sound I heard may have originated from the doorway I stood next to. It felt as though someone on the other side of the veil was watching me, standing there, face to face, even though I could see nothing. I hear somebody standing there, their feet on the gravel. It's like there's somebody standing there. When I turned to face the wall, I hadn't moved my foot yet. Not yet ready to believe it was paranormal, I wanted to continue debunking it by listening further to the other guests approaching even closer in the outer corridor. And because I could hear all the attendees outside in the corridor, I knew they were not the source of the sound. Even though the sound was not picked up on my camera, I still felt we were not wasting our time. Sounds from staircases became a focus for a period.
but we couldn't be certain if what we were hearing was paranormal in nature or simply of natural causes. So instead, we again moved along. After a few more looks in some of the last remaining dungeon areas, we finally worked our way to the second floor, where members of the Paranormal Task Force informed us that there was much activity. Here in this corridor are stories like that of a tall, slender, wispy black figure, possibly female, that glides across the hall into a doorway, and that of a face that will peek around door frames at you, then disappear when you try to find it. Here, members of the Paranormal Task Force are heavily discussing an earlier experience they had and whether or not it was genuine or worthy of debunking. It was hard to tell in the dark if this floor was renovated or untouched. The early to mid 20th century design was still in beautiful and excellent condition. But you know, sometimes I just can't help myself when I see a moment to be silly. Instead of standing around watching, I decided to step up. I tried to briefly reach out, but I knew if there were spirits here with us, they probably weren't going to interact with us with this many people present. Investigating this floor was going to have to be on my bucket list of things to do before tonight's event was over. And at this moment, I already knew this was where I wanted to close out the night. If only I would have known ahead of time just what was going to happen. With the night fading rapidly around 1.30 a.m., we decided to take a different approach to our investigation. Eventually, we moved along to a back staircase which led to an upper floor, where we were told upon arrival that evening had a lot of activity. And once we were on the second floor, I decided to walk around, then stand in the middle of the hallway, and let my senses be my guide. The audio contamination you hear in the background is of the attendees still present on this floor in the connecting rooms in front of me. Jiggle one of the handles. Maybe the locks. Can you touch this device in my hands? Make the alarm go off? Despite the audio contamination coming from the connecting rooms, I still felt that floor had something worth looking into. So, after everybody vacated that floor to the lower sections of the castle, we returned with our cameras and equipment. And it goes without saying that that decision resulted in one hell of an experience. Can you make the top one light up? Can you touch that one? My name's Nathan. Knowing that we were in the theater's dressing room hallway, I suspected the REM pods were responding to electrical cabling below the steps. So it was my job to determine whether or not it was man-made 
or of supernatural origins. There you go. You came back. Oh. Oh, thank you. Can you make all three light up? That'd be very usable. Rearranging equipment to debunk is normal. This, however, is not. In the paranormal world, these light anomalies are known as orbs and thought to be the energy left behind by the deceased. Or that they could be a different form of life altogether. Finally, after many combinations and the efforts to debunk, we decided it was time for the use of another piece of equipment. Stop one. 30 minutes in, I pulled out the SB-11 spirit box, a device proven to be very useful. These AM-FM devices rapidly scale the radio dial in search of voices hidden in the white noise. Hold that thing. Hold that light. Within seconds of asking if anyone was there, a clear voice came through. Susan? I heard Susan. Right after getting that no answer, the REM pod began going off again. Coincidence? Maybe not. See this on my shoulder? Make this light up. But as always, the paranormal plays by its own set of rules. Okay. Look at my arm. Goosebumps, big time. Something's coming next to me. Not the hair, it's the goosebumps. Mm -hmm. Being touched was one thing. Acknowledgement of your name is another. What's my name? You know what my name is? I think I heard of St. Nathan. Huh? I think I heard of St. Nathan. You know what my name is? You know what my name is? My name is. We're here because we respect you. We, we don't wish to annoy you or harm you or anything of that sort. We hope you feel the same way. We just want to communicate. See if there's somebody really here. Or maybe a message you want to convey. We hope that you'll try to communicate with us in a way that doesn't frighten us. But a second try at having your physical senses detect something, that's a whole other world. We do not wish to intrude in your home. In, in this world, we don't see you, we don't exist, but we know you're there. Somehow 
now we know you're there. If we knew better that we were... Oh what? Behind my left arm. Point it. Behind my arm. Point it. Yeah. There. It was as though somebody had actually tried walking behind me and tapped me on the shoulder. Oh, like it's just a cold wave, like a cold something, like a hand. Not a physical hand, it's just like something, something like characteristic of a hand. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, I totally did not expect it. They, they, they loved it when they touched my arm. You notice it? But as anyone who investigates knows, that's what you're there for. There's somebody standing behind me. Can you say something? Walk past me over the one of those devices and say something? Maybe make that top REM pod, that's what that's called, on, top, on that top step. Can you make that light up again? Go do it. With it being after 3 a.m. and activity beginning to fall flat, I decided it was time to break down our equipment and leave. After transferring collected equipment downstairs, I bumped into Cindy Shipley, our Pythian Castle tour guide. As I was preparing to show her footage that we had caught, she reveals to us that she doesn't even think she's even seen that part of the castle until now. And watching her reaction to our footage was priceless. With this being our first investigation in a building of this size, it was kind of new for us to be tired around 3.30 a.m. After packing up all of our equipment, we ran into another team of investigators as we were heading towards the doors. So, getting anything? We did upstairs. Really? Yeah. We had three run plugs on the steps and put a camera on it. And... Cool. And despite having the <laughs> scared out of me several times upstairs, each experience was worth every moment. The Pythian Castle permitted us many experiences that evening. From the stories of footsteps in the tunnels to the images we caught in our photos. Again, it was a pleasure to meet the Paranormal Task Force and all of their members. And let us not forget to thank the spirits still wandering these corridors and the history they created worth protecting and preserving for future generations to learn from. We hope one day to return to this beautiful location and reach out once again for more interaction with the other side.